Okay, hello. My name is Stefan Saalfeld. Um, I come from, from Dresden in Germany, from, from Pavel Tomaczak's lab. And thanks a lot that I uh, was invited to speak here. It's a pleasure. And what I'm going to talk about here is um, not about modeling and not about simulating at all, um, because we are not involved in that, but um, we are working on software components um, that we designed to um, reconstruct um, conic foams from, from insect brains in the first place, but it can be used for, for reconstruction of any kind. And um, these reconstructions are performed on the um, electron microscopy resolution. So the, um, the target of these software tools is essentially to handle very large data sets and to, um, to, to align them and to um, um, bring them together and to register them and then um, provide um, um, multi um, scale uh, representations of the annotations that you're, that you're painting on top of them. And these um, free software components are <coughs> a web interface um, which has the fancy name CutMate, which stands for a Collaborative Annotation Toolkit for Massive Amounts of Image Data. Acronyms are very important, as you know. And um, then the desktop application TrackEM2, which is an ImageJ plugin to, to handle large zero section data sets and a bit more. And um, last but not least, our uh, more recent project is um, ImageLib2. It's a Java based um, image processing library that aims to um, simplify working with um, n dimensional um, data with arbitrary pixel types and um, transporting a method implementation from, from a, from a um, simple memory based um, um, image layout into a, into a hard disk based layout so, so there it, that it doesn't expose um, problems on the, on the infrastructural level to the method implementation. Um, let me start um, with the biological context that we're working in. The project is mostly driven by a person which is more um, known in this community. This is Albert Cardona. <coughs> He's now working in Genelia Farm and he um, is interested in reconstructing the connectome from um, a Drosophila early larval brain. And this is what you see here. Um, that's, a s uh, that's a... Where's my mouse actually? I don't see it. Because it is not connected. Yeah. There you go. So this is a sketch of the brain. Um, it has two brain lobes, like um, in, a, in a human brain, essentially, and then it has what, um, what um, in vertebrates is the spinal nerve cord. This is here, this, um, this ventral nerve cord, so it's on the front side of the insect and not on the back side, and consists of thoracical segments and of um, ventral segments. And Albert has generated um, um, one very exceptional um, serial section data set on the EM resolution of one of these um, ventral um, nerve cord segments that you um, see um, in a, in a massively downscaled version here. And um, now um, in his lab he is reconstructing um, essentially all cells that are visible in that volume starting from the cell body if it is visible in the, in the data set um, through all the um, neurites um, ending up at the synaptic contacts. And in order to do that, um, yeah, exactly. I, I forgot one thing, and um, we not only want to reconstruct um, this data um, on the on the electron microscopy resolution, but we al also want to um, correlate it with um, optical microscopy data. And this is one example um, of how this brain looks under a confocal um, scanning microscope. That's a clone where um, single cells are are, are made visible um, with a flipout construct. This also stems from Genelia Farm, from the um, group of Jerry Rubin. <coughs> And um, the white cells that you see here are cells marked with an anti uh, GABAergic um, stain. So, so these cells are, are GABAergic cells. And with a bit of luck, you had some of your, of your clones um, that are GABAergic. Then you'll know, know a lot um, more about these cells. OK, let's talk about the software. Um, TrackEM2 whoops, looks like that. <coughs> it offers you a, a display canvas where you can watch your data. And um, it offers you a navigator screen. And on, on top of this data, you can, you can browse your image data and you can, you can annotate whatever you see in there um, with a lot of geometric primitives. This is um, freeform primitives, as you see here, to um, actually mark the volume of cellular or subcellular components at will. Um, but it also um, offers you uh, more simplified constructs like um, skeleton traces to, to just mark the, the, um, the neurites and um, and um, ball structures to, to mark maybe, for example, a, a, a nucleus in a cell, and, and, and by that build up these, uh, these ball stick models that are, that are very common in the community. Um, you associate all these um, volumetric annotations um, with, a, with, a, with a term um, of, a, of a freely um, to be specified um, ontology. This is a hierarchical ontology, so you can um, define your own terms. In this case, um, we see a brain, we see cell membranes, and whatsoever. 
And in the end, um, this is the abstract um, ontology part, and in the end, it, uh, it, um, so it finishes at a, at, a, at a concrete term, which is then the, the annotation um, piece that you have on your screen. So Tracheum 2 can not only display um, this single channel um, electron microscopy data, but you can also um, join multiple um, data elements into the, into the same canvas and overlay them using various, um, various um, um, graphical overlays. What we see here is a manually um, aligned um, um, data set from, from, from a confocal microscope, so the resolution is extremely um, poor compared to the EM data set, but you um, see structures um, that are that were otherwise not distinguishable in the, in the EM data set. Okay, so what you see here is um, that this EM data set was not captured um, in a single run, um, and the main reason is that it is um, essentially too big for that, um, at least um, when, when using a, a normal CCD camera, which has a, re a resolution of 2K by 2K pixels or, or 4K by 4K pixels. So um, what you would do is you would um, image um, all these, these, um, these sections <coughs> in, in overlapping tiles and you have to stitch them together. And then um <coughs> I actually forgot to mention that this is zero section data, so it's actually um, taken from a block of tissue. You generate all these sections, they are floating on a water bath, and then they are collected um <coughs> by a very dedicated and careful person on a on an electron uh, microscopy grid. This person must be um, so dedicated, he must be able to stop his heart beating and stop breathing for a, an infinite amount of time to not destroy all these sections, to not lose so many. And um, his name is Rick Fetter, and he's also working in Geneva Farm. <coughs> um, but nevertheless, um, while, while generating these, um, these sections, you're applying a lot of deformation to the, to the, to the um, single sections. And while imaging, you're deforming the single image tiles because um, while the um, electron beam is making an image, it's heating up the section and then it's deforming and whatsoever. So we're getting a lot of deformation in this process. And um, <coughs> my task in this business was to, um, to restore essentially the, the volume information from all these um, section images. And um, this is um, work that is also available in Dracium 2 and we have two modes of, of registration. In the first place, um, this is a, a landmark-based registration that is using um, a process from, from computer vision. So it's extracting um, invariant image features from, from all these image tiles, and it can not only <coughs> bring them into alignment by using these features, but also um, recognize which image belongs where. So essentially, you can, you can um, start a montage by just um, throwing all images on top of each other, and then it finds out how they, how they are arranged. And um, <coughs> in the end, you have a, you have a, a large set of, of, of corresponding points that um, spread across all these images. And you put um, all these, these um, point correspondences into, a, into, a, into an optimizer that um, minimizes the, the, the sum of square displacements of all these points. And um, what we see here is um, a minor extension of that paper that you see down here. Um, it's using a, and a fine transformation for each um, image tile, which is regularized um, with respect to a rigid transformation that it doesn't shrink to infinity. So, can okay, can yeah? I see if I've understood what's happening here. Yeah. This is a collection of uh, images you've taken mm -hmm. uh, because you, can, you have to tile the surface. Yeah. And the uh, green lines, are they, are they part of the information that you use to, uh, to arrange the... Let me start here. Let me start here. So this is the size of an image. This is, in this case, it's 2K by 2K, yeah. right? And um, you have a lot of these images. Yeah. And then from each of the images, you extract um, image features. This is um, what Microsoft is using for the virtual tours, and what Panorama Stitching software is using for Panorama Stitching, whatsoever. Okay. And then for each of these um, features, these are actually the green points. Uh, whatever is green here is a point. So it is an interest point, which has a um, specific green location green in space. Yeah. interesting features. That it's interesting points that are that be used for recoverable in, in overlapping images, exactly. And then for each of these features, you have a descriptor. And descriptor is invariant uh, with respect to, um, to some sort of transformation. So it's um, invariant um, with respect to rotation, to scale, and also to some amount of affine Mirror. transformation. Mirror or not. So you would have to do two then. But then it's invariant, right? So you can achieve that, and um, and then you have you have all these these points associated to each other. And this is mm -hmm. necessary because I'm, I'm a bit puzzled because since you mm -hmm. already have the slide, you already know roughly which order mm -hmm. they are in. That's what we're doing in reality, but it's not required. 
So in principle, you could just have mm. these as. But the movie uh, looks so much better if you don't initialize it with a with a um, pre known configuration. I'm telling you. No, what you, what you would do in reality is actually you compare only what you know what is, what is belonging to each other and you initialize it with a nice configuration and also you don't, you don't let the, the optimizer start at this crazy point because this is just weird. Okay. So you would, you would um, just run a snake through it and then pre-align it somehow and then, and then sort of the final solution, but this is, this is really nicer, isn't it? Yeah, good. And yes, and as you see, you, do, you don't do this only for, for one section, but for, for all of them and all at once, and, and then you have a, um, a, a global cost function. Okay. Can you do the yeah. 2D? This is a two-dimensional problem, right? So we have, we have all these images, and, 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 and they, have a, they have an x, y, lo y location to points, and we are also correlating them across the sections, but you are, you are not tilting the sections or you are not moving them around in that way. And the resolution at yeah? which you do this is much less than the resolution of the actual images. You're just using the coordinates of the reference points, is that correct? I'm using the coordinates of the reference points, but they have the resolution of the of the image. So you're getting a few hundred points per each image. Okay. And then but it is a sparse representation. That simplifies the problem. Yes, exactly. And that's why we come to the next slide. I mean this looks nice and um, from a from a global perspective um, it is it is beautiful, but it's only solving for a linear um, model um, per per each image. And if the images are large and the local deformation sucks um, and is very horrible, <coughs> then you are ending up with a stack that looks like that. And um, this is now the, the topic of the of the next um, alignment procedure um, that we built. Um, we are we're now associating from starting from that point. We are finding corresponding regions um, in adjacent sections and further sections and further sections, so to to, to make it really a, a dense connection, and then um, feed this into a Spring connected particle system, relax it, and in the end you come up with a, with, a, um, with an alignment that is um, very close to to block phase um, scanning or, or even even FIPS and EM. Okay, <coughs> this has been done. Yes, so um, let's go back here. Um, this is um, a, an auto um, projection, so an auto slice through the through the stack. So every pixel line here is one section one individual. And you also see um, artifacts in here. So for example, this one here is a standing artifact, this is a standing artifact, um, all these, these black lines here are standing artifacts. So when you, whoops, even when you, when you have the, the align situation, you're seeing these black spots here, they are individual, uh, they're, they're independent for each section. So th the system must be very robust to, uh, with respect to all these um, differences that are actually not interesting. Good. Okay, we have done this for the entire data set, and if you look like that, it's, um, that's it. This is a, a global view, we zoom into it, and we zoom into it, and here at that resolution you can actually see the synapses. These are the, the little black areas um, between the neuroids. <coughs> and from that data, um, then finally, um, reconstructions are generated. Um, this data set, I, I must say, is not um, the most perfect one. So we are, um, okay, this is a, an auto slice projection, but I'm, um, I cannot actually play forward here. But yeah, you're getting what it is about, right? So from the side, it looks like from, from top, good. And um, now Engineer Farm, they're generating even larger data sets. Um, this is um, a, um, a cross section from a ventral nerve cut from an L3 larva, so from an older larva of the Drosophila. And um, it's just 20 um, sections running forth and back. But the interesting part is that um, at this data here, you can see the microtubules running through. You see that? Should I do it again? Sorry. So it's 200 image tiles per each section, and 20 sections running forth and back. Um, they were lens corrected. Everything was nice, so the protocol was very um, well set up. And now, if we if we go in here, you see here these um, these small spots. This is the microtubules running through. And they're nice in place, so good result, I hope. Um, what impact does this alignment have on reconstructions? This is a reconstruction um, of the of, of um, some neuron and others during done done um, by Albert Cotton on a on a very bad aligned data set. <coughs> and you see all this jitter from section to section. So um, from from top down here, you have the um, section direction. And when we um, elastically align all the system then um, these projections look um, much more realistic and actually represent what the, what the um, neural so tissue is about. Hmm? 
Are you, how much do you estimate as your residue jitter? In this one here? Hmm? No, in, in, the, in the original ends. Compared, so you end up with a bit of jitter, I saw, even, even after all the alignment. Hmm? How much is that in nanometers right there? Um, I would say it is in the range of, of 10 nanometers, something like that. It can be more. So it depends on how, how thick your sections are. I mean, you cannot do um, really better than, than, than what your section thickness is giving you, and this is 40 nanometers in this case. So um, yeah, 10 to 40 nanometers, maybe more at very bad locations. Yeah. OK. Um, so this is a serious impact on um, when you calculate the length of, 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 of these um, neural profiles. <coughs> and what we see here is from the original jitter reconstruction, um, when we just measure from, from every point in the skeleton to another, um, what is the, the estimated cable length here. And we compare this to a, to a um, simplified length, uh, a low bound length, where you in the skeleton um, replace all um, branch point to branch point connections by just straight lines, so it is um, relatively robust with respect to, to um, reconstruction jitter. And um, we see that the um, elastic method um, brings these two measures very close together. They're not expected to be um, equal because the, the um, branch point to branch point connection is a simplification, of course. But the difference is not um, that significant anymore, and it um, seems more reasonable. Okay, people involved are in the first place Albert Cardona, who um, made this um, software project. Um, I wrote um, registration libraries for, for me, and, and, and many other people have contributed to it. It's uh, embedded in the, in the Fiji distribution of ImageJ, so you can just download and, 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 and try it. And um, it was um, supported by um, several hackathons in Janelia Farm, in the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, and at EMBL in Heidelberg, and also in, in, in Zurich. And yeah, these are the websites. Um, this one is the shorter one, so um, <laughs> if you want to look at that. Good. Next project. Um, Trachium 2 is nice. It has a um, lot of um, features for annotation and for registration, but it um, poses a significant problem when it comes for to, to uh, manual annotation, namely that it is a desktop application and it stores its data into an XML file. And so putting one single person in front of these massive data sets and ask it to reconstruct <coughs> is unfeasible. So you need many people doing that. And that has been done in the past in Arbert's lab and also in Davi, um, in Davi Box work in, in, at Harvard by uh, merging then XML files and then and making complicated operations to bring this data together, which is a, a, a complete nightmare in terms of, of data processing. And um, so we are, we are now focusing on, 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 a, on a different approach. So we um, register the data with TrackEM2 and um, then make this data available in a, in a web interface. And this web interface is um, backed by a, by, a, um, by a server database. And the name of it is CatMate. There we are. <coughs> it has a, a thin browser client that uh, allows you um, Google Maps style navigation on this data. Um, it is connected to this, to this metadata and annotation data server and the images can be fetched from, from any other machine that wants to serve images. <coughs> and that interface looks like that. Um, so we're looking here at a serial section EM dataset, Google Maps style browsing, you can zoom in. And uh, you have a navigator window, so you can jump on the navigator window. It is uh, relatively quick, particularly when you're in a local network. <coughs> and it's very slow when you do it across the Atlantic Ocean, <laughs> I noticed. <coughs> And um, in this original version, which was developed um, back in, in 2008, essentially, um, we had very basic annotation tools. So as you can see here, you can run through the um, Z sections. Um, it's also quick because you, you only have to load the, the image tiles that are um, um, visible on the screen. And the basic annotation tools that you had here um, are mainly text labels that have a location um, in, the, in the screen. <coughs> OK, I forgot one feature. You can make a URL, like um, in Google Maps, um, point me to this location and send it to some collaborator, and you will see um, the same structure on the screen. But now let's look at these, um, these annotations. Um, you can log in into this um, web interface, and you, can, um, you have these, um, these text labels floating, floating on, the, on, the, on, the, on the image data, and you can um, drag them around, delete them, and edit them. And, um, because this data set is public, um, there's about 100 people editing crazy um, text terms onto it, so don't take anything serious which is on it. 
and you can um, type this text on the screen, you can change the, the color information and whatsoever. So it's very basic. Um, what the system also allows you is to, uh, to um, crop data. And this is the, the um, next tool that I, that I want, want to show you here. So you can, um, ha you can mark a, a region on the screen and uh, mark a, 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 a Z space in there and then um, press the apply button, then it tells you, okay, I'm, I, I, I'm generating that on the, on, the, on the server, and the server is generating this um, crop data element and um, providing you with a, um, with a download link. <coughs> and because this is an asynchronous operation, um, the CapMate interface has a, has a message system, so whenever you log in the next time, you're getting a bunch of messages like emails, <coughs> and you can download this data, and here we see the, the cropped region. Um, seen through through the image chain interface. So we have cropped it at a, a different resolution. Um, CutMate not only enables to, to browse a single data set, but you can associate um, several um, image data sets um, into the same project space. So essentially it has um, decoupled um, coordinate systems. Um, one is for the, for the image data set and one is for the project coordinate system. And as you can see here, the annotations, like the neural pile tag, which is here, is um, um, not in the image coordinate system, but it is in the project coordinate system, so whenever you add a stack to it and register it into it, it appears at the right location. Um, yeah, that's mostly about the, the old version, and um, now um, Albert's group, um, particularly um, driven by, by Stefan Gerhardt, has extended this interface to um, support more complex annotations, and they have transferred the, the full skeleton annotation tool from Trakiam2 into, into um, CutMate. And this is what you see here. You see actually um, Albert um, reconstructing um, skeleton traces from, from this data set. It provides you with a lot of information about these um, skeleton traces. Um, you can um, not only annotate these skeletons, you can um, also proofread them. So it has a full proofreading system because manual annotations are sometimes not perfect. Each skeleton and each annotation in the system is associated with a, with a user who has created it. And um, by that, there is no ambiguity like on merging these XML files, um, when happened what and, and, and by whom it was done. And um, yeah, that's mostly it. And we're looking forward to um, extending this by, by um, more advanced annotation toolkits. Um, yeah, fancy 3D view um, using WebGL, also done by Stefan Gerhardt, very nice. Um, where you can then look at what you have reconstructed on the on the image data. <coughs> okay, I'm um, skipping forward. Um, what is the database backend of of these annotations done in in CutMate? The ontology that we are that we are able to express here is a bit uh, more complex than the uh, hierarchical system which is available in TrackyM. So we have made a, a, a Postgres uh, representation of, a, of an ontology that consists of classes, of class instances. So each class instances is, instance is referring to, to a particular class. Um, it has relations and relation instances, and the relation instances can um, associate to classes, and they can, um, or they can associate to um, class instances. That means um, you can express a, a sentence like, um, all cells are surrounded by membrane, and you can associate. You can also express a sentence like, um, "Say cell A is green," something like that, right? Whereas then green is a class instance of <coughs> of of um, the class color. <coughs> All these um, these um, concepts are inheriting from a concept table, we're making um, explicit use of um, Postgres um, um, table inheritance um, concept, and um, Mark, Mark Longer has um, transferred um, a neuroanatomy ontology for, for fly brains into the system, so it um, is fully equipped with, a, with, a, um, with the abstract part of these ontologies. Um, this is the abstract domain, <coughs> and in the, in the um, concrete domain, then um, you, you create tables for your uh, particular, particular annotation tools, um, what we see here. Is, um, is the, the concepts that we need to express um, skeleton traces in the system. So we have three nodes that have a parent um, child relationship. <coughs> and um, we have also um, single locations in space, and all these single locations um, and, and, and three nodes can then be associated with an abstract term like um, um, belongs to or is, is element of a skeleton, which is then an abstract term, and the skeleton is a model of a neuro neuronal arbor, and the neuronal arbor is a part of a neuron, and so on. So you can extract um, very, very informative um, int um, things out of, out of these annotations. <coughs> um, 
what is coming in the future, um, Cutmate has now a, a relatively nice um, interface design, which is very simple, but, it, but it's, it's also flexible. So we have a tiled window manager where you can drag windows around. It's actually very nice to, to work on very large screens, not on very small screens. Um, it has toolbars and a, a bunch of widgets like sliders and, 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 and input fields and whatsoever. Um, it separates between project coordinates and image coordinates, as, as I've told you before, and um, future versions will um, extend this into, into an n-dimensional domain, currently it's three-dimensional, and it, it is going to be an n-dimensional domain, and also the um, association of um, the image coordinates into the project coordinates um, will be n-dimensional um, affine transformations. Um, the the um, reason why we're going to do this is um, because we want to use it in the end for um, for tracing cells in, in four-dimensional um, images of Drosophila embryo development, where you have um, where you have essentially the the, the, the oh, <laughs> so I'm skipping the last part completely. <laughs> cool. Where you have um, where you have an image of each cell and where it um, moves um, in, in 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 space over time, and this at very high resolution. Okay, future. Um, Future um, projects to come, um, we want to, to add volumetric annotations and, uh, and different imaging backends, and we want to uh, um, connect it with um, server-side image processing for supporting um, automatic um, segmentation that, is, that, is, um, that has a um, feedback by, by um, user interaction. And dimensional data, I have said, and um, that's an ambitious project. I don't know, what, I don't know exactly um, if, we, if we're achieving it, um, but uh, it's an interesting idea. Still, this Google Maps style interfacing is a bit slow when it comes to, to screen refresh, and, and people like to have 30 frames per second um, running through, through the data set. And the, the only way to do that, actually, is by, by displaying the canvas as a movie. And I think that's what is happening at some point, that we just um, replace this display layer with a movie that is generated on the server. And what you're doing with your mouse is actually um, the remote control to generate that movie on the server. Future music. Okay, people involved here, um, mostly important Stefan Gerhardt, who has developed um, this skeleton annotation toolkit, and um, the, the WebGL viewer, Mark Longe, who was um, very much involved in trying all these things forward. Uh, there has been one hackathon um, by now in Genelia Farm, and the project is funded by Max Planck and um, Albert and Genelia Farm. Um, so my last part of the, of the talk, which I will not accomplish now, <laughs> is this generic Im image processing library. And because we are, we are um, not seeing the presentation slides, I want to show you just a few examples. Um, the aim of this library is to virtualize pixel access. And it does so in the Java programming language, and it maps these, these, um, these pixel objects into, into primitive Java type arrays. So you can store large data, and you can, um, you can write new backends, and the front end is not seeing that because we access these pixels through iterators and random access um, accessors. And um, by that, you can actually achieve um, some very um, interesting um, portabilities of software. So there's a simple image viewer. It loads an image, <coughs> and the viewer essentially only knows that it displays a grid of pixels. That's very simple. So it loads an image, and this is a grid of pixels. So far, so good. But if you want to, um, to move it around, um, this, um, this grid of pixels um, needs, to, needs to be transferred into real space, and you do that by, um, by interpolation. But what the result of that is then that you have um, a function that is um, defined for every coordinate in real space, so it's defined for all real coordinates. And, um, that's all what you need to then feed it into a transformation, which again generates um, uh, an image which is um, defined at all real coordinates. And nothing of that is happening in memory, but it's all generated on the fly. So we're transferring the coordinates on the fly, we're transferring the pixel values on the fly. And you can see that here, this is nearest neighbor interpolation. We can switch it to other interpolation types. <laughs> and there we are. Um, the interesting part, this is very boring because it is just an image. You can use the same kind of view to feed it with um, data that is um, at no point in time living in memory. So we have the same viewer. And we see a fractal here. And we can um, zoom into it. We can drag it around. And now there is no interpolation involved. But the result of that is a function that is defined on all real coordinates and can provide you with a pixel value. And there you see that I'm not um, 
cheating, um, we can also change this function on the fly and um, generate new pixel values. So this is not only um, possible with this kind of data, but we can also um, um, do um, a nearest neighbor interpolator, as we've seen before, on on, on pixel data, which is um, not on a on a on a discrete pixel grid, but just um, where, where each pixel has a has a has a independent coordinate. The same viewer again. This is um, um, a randomly sampled um, image data. It's actually not random. It's a phyllotaxis pattern because it looks very beautiful. <coughs> and we are using the same viewer again. And to just explain what it does, it is not. Um, it is not transferring this into into vector coordinates or something like that, but it's um, it's performing nearest neighbor search per each per each pixel that we see on the screen to generate this this interpolated data. <coughs> okay, this is not working only in a two D plane, but it's also um, working for for n dimensional data. And the examples that I show you here, wow. <laughs> is um, again a fly brain so we can rotate in this volume and run back and forward and zoom in change the um, way of how we interpolate it and then rotate around um, several points and only on the fly generate then um, these particular pixel types so um, the volume is not um, recreated in memory and then you can do um, other fancy things like um, changing the algebra that the pixels are actually doing and using basic operations on them and that's a, a very silly no, uh, I mean you could do it on the GPU if you want, but um, you don't have to. So the, the, you actually, so the the the, um, the end application, so the end uh, method that you're using for that, which um, fetches a pixel value on the on the screen, doesn't care where it's coming from, right? So whether it is it is coming from a from a from a from memory or if it is generated by some other process is not interesting for it because the because the access is virtual. And um, you could generate it on the GPU, but in this case it's generated um, by the CPU. But Good. Say again. In the end, it will have to be stored in some buffer. To be in the end, it is it is coming into a buffer. Yes. But um, no intermediate steps, right? You can make intermediate steps to to um, to improve um, speed. This is possible, of course. Because but it's stored in a buffer, it is coming from memory. But you, you mean something else by what you said? Yeah, yeah. Well, but uh, well, but look at this fractal, for example. Um, the only thing that is stored in memory in the end is what you have on the screen, right? Yeah. right? So there's no anything else is a function, right? Exactly. And um, well, actually, a better example is here, um, where we have this catmate stack. Um, serving as a backend for this data and this image data that you see in here um, in, in its whole um, 3D size is um, decompressed to 70 gigabytes so that wouldn't fit into this machine, right? Um, but still we can um, we can navigate in here, it's a bit slow because it's fetching these tiles and the uh, um, speed is a bit limited by, um, by JPEG de decompression but we can, um, we can have um, 3D navigation in this kind of data set and the, and the display, the, the viewer is not caring where the data is coming from, right? So even if you, if you do image processing on that, it's not caring where the data is coming from, you just um, replace the backend. And so it's a, it's a clear separation of, of um, where you do what. So you're not intermingling um, your method implementation with infrastructure. That's a nice part. Okay, and yeah, the Silly example that I wanted to show is that not, not only um, you can you can um, um, do virtual pixel access, but you can also generate new pixel types that um, just overload the the algebra that you're doing here. And th in this case, you see a, a poor man simulation um, where we just have a have a pixel type that has um, a class and a value. So each pixel is a population of a species, right? And the the, the weight in the in the species is a is a floating point number, and um, the only thing we overload here is the uh, addition operation. So when you add um, two of these pixels, then depending on whether they are the same class, they just add on top of each other, and if not, they are fighting against each other, and um, the stronger one wins and subtracts. Um, so the, um, the, um, the weight of the, of the weaker one is um, subtracted from it. And um, using this pixel type, you can then um, just execute um, Gaussian convolution on the image and do it over and over and over again. So you get distribution and at the borders between the species they are fighting. 
and in the region here if it exceeds some threshold they're all extincting and starting from scratch that's essentially it so you're using using um, a simple operation as gaussian convolution just overlet the operators mm -hmm. and then um, by that you can express um, interesting things i think good so much about it i think my time is over is it good <laughs> thanks for your attention